The, the former chapter, let me remind you of Isaiah 56, because it's now been several weeks. At the end of Isaiah 56, the wicked and the lazy, godless, false shepherds and rulers of Israel were being rebuked, prophetically speaking. Um, and they're described as drunken fools who basically got so drunk on the job that they didn't see the enemy approaching. And so that's how, really, how Isaiah 56 finished. And then we begin into Isaiah 57. We're carrying on. So really, there isn't a gap here. We've just been told that the wicked false shepherds of Israel are drunk and can't see to warn the people. And now we continue to be told about another group of people, the righteous, and that's how <coughs> Isaiah 57 begins. And then it does go again back to calling the wicked amongst the slain. So we're dealing with what we're dealing with today in our own <coughs> faith communities. Israel was dealing with a nation that by far the majority were idolatrous and had syncretized their worship, but there was still a remnant of righteous, <coughs> a remnant that had kept set apart for God. We too are dealing with this today. So there's a lot in this that we can apply to our own lives today and to our own uh, faith community today. There was a moment where um, your lovely daughter was reading and the words struck deep and meaningfully for me because the word contrite, yes. it stood so strongly because if you have a contrite heart, the Lord doesn't turn away. He's prepared to hear you and it may be that the children of Israel have gone so far away but within those who have wandered off their front and centre, there will be those who will think again. And Come they will want to repair the damages and want to fix with the Lord relationship. And I just love that word. It's a beautiful word, isn't it? Con contrite, so in English, contrite encapsulates ideas of godly sorrow, repentance, humility, it unites all these ideas together. So it's quite a beautiful, um, some would say, older English word, because it's not a word you hear often today. Uh, but today p people would probably mistakenly simplify it too much and say humility. But that would be oversimplification. It, it encapsulates, like I said, repentance, godly sorrow, humility, and an understanding that you're not in control a letting go of control. This is what this word contrite means. So it is a very beautiful word, yeah. It was interesting that the, the other side of that was God says, I am high and lofty. I dwell in the heights. He doesn't say but. He says, I dwell in the heights and with the one who is contrite. So he gives us an understanding of who he is, that you can't get away from him. But he also gives us a sense of order and position, so that he reminds us, but I'm the greatest of the great. You don't get higher than me. However, as high as I am, I'm right present with you in your contrite spirit. It's beautiful. Okay, what else did people notice? We'll pull out some of these things and then we'll systematically just go through from verse to verse and I'll just read you the translation I've made from the Hebrew and we might see a few different things there. Okay, let's take a read through. Let's take a read through because I think some other questions will come up. Reading 57 verse 1. Hasadeg, the righteous, Avad, he perishes. The aim ish, and no man or no person lays it upon their core being, live, heart. Remember we talked about this before. The heart is not the seat of the, the emotion for the Jew. For the Hebrew, the heart is the center of being. Okay, So let's clarify that. For the Hebrew, when we say heart, we mean the point at which all parts of our humanity converge. Spirit, soul, mind, action, emotion. We don't mean, as the Greeks do, the seat of emotion. Okay, That's not what we mean. So, no one takes the fact that the righteous have perished to heart to their core being. No one thinks about it in the depth of their being. 
young Sheikh Hesed, merciful men of standing, are taken away. Be'ain, while none understand, for from before the face, hara'a, of the evil. I think that's interesting. The Hebrew doesn't say before the face of evil, or it would say ra'a, but it says ha ra'a, before the face of the evil. So these righteous ones are being taken away from the greatest evil, not just an evil. I think that's worth considering. It means this has become a spiritual teaching as well as being a contextual teaching within time and space. The righteous are gathered in. Now that's beautiful language. They're not ripped out of their slots. They're not torn away. They're gathered in. They're gathered in, taken away. Another beautiful word, they're received. They're received. So are there any thoughts on what's going on here? Remembering that we ended the last chapter with the wicked shepherds and rulers, the watchers of Israel, drunk and failing to warn Israel of the evil that is to come. And now this begins with the righteous being, well, the righteous perishing. That's a reference to them dying a physical death, taken away. Again, a reference for them being taken from this life. But then the reason for it is that they might be taken away from the face of ha ra the evil. I think that's interesting. It's worth talking about. The righteous are gathered. We've talked about where they're gathered to, so let's put that out of the way. They're gathered to Gan Eden, to paradise. The English versions I'm looking at don't even make reference to this evil. Okay, could you read read what yours says? Okay, well, I've got the ESV here, the English Standard Version. The right, no, I'll read the whole verse one. The righteous man perishes and no one lays it to heart. Yeah. Devout men are taken away while no one understands. Mm-hmm. For the righteous man is taken away from calamity. No reference to before the face of evil or an evil or anything. Calamity uh, is an interesting choice. Yeah. Uh, what we've got here, the ISV, the International Standard Version, I think it is. Uh, also, the righteous are perishing, but no one takes it to heart. Devout people are taken away, while no one understands that the righteous person is taken away from calamity. Yeah. So, the only reason I can think for that translation is possibly that the Septuagint uses the Greek word for calamity. Um, but there's no way that that is a right translation of the Hebrew text. No, no, really, it really just goes to show um, that at times there is a critical difference and we need to be aware of it yeah. between yeah. the Hebrew and what it should be and yeah. how English. Thank, thanks for pointing that out. This is definitely not calamity that's being talked about. Okay, it's, that's a really poor translation. The Hebrew word ra'a, it means evil. It means evil. It's not calamity. Calamity is not evil. They're not the same thing. We know. AMP? Amplified, right? Yeah. We know Isaiah is a prophet, but is this prophetic of a certain place and time? Yes. So this is definitely prophetic of the evil that was coming from Babylon against Israel, which the former chapter tells us about. Your Your watchers or your watchmen have grown drunk and can't warn you of the evil to come. That evil to come is the Babylonian exile. So in time and space, definitely that's what it applies to. However, there's also the fact that we read the remes or the hint at the spiritual impact of that statement. The righteous are taken away so that they don't stand in the face of the evil. Well, we could read into that a message of the gospel that really the greatest evil is that which is experienced by those who perpetually refuse God's mercy. And, and that is a warning prophetically even today for all of us. Uh, and, and some of us, Karen and others, of us have suffered the loss of loved ones recently, loved ones who are righteous ones. And there is some sense that God is doing the same today, that he's taking them away from what's to come. 
And I think we see the world around us. We see our own country and what's happening in it and the darkness that's so pervasive. He has and continues to enter into shalom, peace. They have and continue to rest. They have and continue to rest, remain, dwell upon their beds who walk in straightness, rightness, in the front of. So there's the idea that the Hebrew offers us a sense of perpetuity, a, a sense of ongoingness. In other words, he didn't cease. It's not like he had peace, he's entered peace, over. It's he continues to enter into peace, so it's an ongoing thing. Which, as we've said before and we've discussed already, speaks of the afterlife. And it shows us that the afterlife was understood quite clearly by ancient Jews, despite the lie that many Christian theologians and Bible colleges teach, which is that Jews didn't have a proper understanding of the afterlife until the Hellenization of the known world. So the scripture refutes that. But it is commonly taught in our tertiary institutions and in many churches. Um, it's not true, however. So I just wanted to point that out. So verse 3, there are 10, but you, plural, it's all of you. And this is interesting because he's about to rebuke these people. But listen to what he says. Draw near. Draw near here and now. And then he calls them a really harsh name. Okay. He says, Benai onina, children of a sorceress. But he doesn't stop there. Zera minaif, seed from an adulterer. But he's not done. And a whore. Listen carefully. So those who are opposed to God or are disobedient within Israel at this time, so I'm not talking about the righteous, we've dealt with them. He's saying draw near. Why does he say draw near? Because he's a father who loves his children. Now what he's going to say is harsh, but he wants them close. He wants them to hear it well. And there's actually a teaching here in the different names he uses. Okay, so children of a sorceress. So sorcery is witchcraft, yeah? Children of an adulterer. See, adultery destroys family, doesn't it? Children of a whore. So whoring wastes seed. It's often associated with abortion. It's often associated with both the destruction of the family and the community, the destruction of the individual who is the prostitute, and the silencing of the family line that might have come forth from the fruit of that prostitution. So this is, this is fair warning. We could say this is practical rebuke. Witchcraft. Does anyone know to what God, God likens witchcraft elsewhere in the Bible? There's a very important thing he likens witchcraft to in the Bible. It's fundamental. Okay, I had three rebel four rebellions. You nailed it. So first Samuel fifteen twenty three. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. And both are idolatry. So he's showing them how their condition is manifest. Idolatry, rebellion against God, is the root of all sin. So he's saying, start here. You've rebelled against me. That's where your problem starts. Then he says, you children of an adulterer, because you've rebelled against me, you are willfully destroying your own families. Adultery has become generational. Notice that all these are children of. You are not the first generation to be sorceresses. You are children of a sorceress. You are not the first adulterous generation. You are children of adulterers. You are not the first to engage prostitutes. You are children of prostitutes. Which means you're possibly fatherless or motherless or being cared for by an entirely different family. Again, the breaking apart of family. And all of this is figurative because adultery and prostitution are idolatry as well. And we read it later in the same passage. Now see how that connects to New Zealand today. I won't even address the rest of the Western world, but just New Zealand alone. 
Because we have turned our backs on God as a country, as a people, we have seen an increase in adultery, an increase in sexual immorality. And the fruit of that has been an increase of broken families, broken children, because we're sinning generationally against our children. And so this word, it's for us today. We, we have, um, God's calling us as, as a community of believers to be those who don't become known as children of adultery, as children of sorcery, as children of whoring. In, in modern Hebrew, we'd say benzona, benzona. Hebrew is wonderful. Like in, in English, we would say son of a bitch, wouldn't we? That's what we'd say, son of a bitch. But, but in Hebrew, colloquially, we say benzona. Benzona is literally son of a whore. You know, you're shocked because I said son of a bitch. Essentially, this is exactly what is being said. Because in Hebrew, it is the equivalent. You know, we're, we're shocked. We're shocked. Well, maybe the church could, could use with hearing son of a bitch said from the pulpit from time to time. This is the reality, guys. Verse 4. Against whom do you mock? And this is twofold, guys. This is to the wicked in, in Israel. Against whom do you mock? Against whom do you open wide your mouth, lengthening your tongue? Are you not children of rebellion? Now Isaiah explains what sorcery is, doesn't he? Seed of lies, seed of deceit. Proverbs tells us what the woman, the harlot, the homebreaker is. She's a woman with deceptive tongue who woos the young man from the street saying, I have given my offerings. I have purified myself. My husband is away. Come. So, so he's illuminating what all of this is. But there's an important correlation here between evil and sexual immorality. The figurative nature of sexual immorality is always connected to some of the worst kinds of evil and idolatry. And it's important we understand that because today we might say in New Zealand, oh, but, you know, every Joe Bloggs down the street isn't worshipping Molech or sacrificing their babies on altars in the valleys, but we are murdering our babies in hospitals. We call it abortion, you know. We are committing adultery and breaking up families. So it may not look like ancient idolatry, but it sure as hell is. It's rebranded. Rebranded, but it's the same stuff. Reading on, verse 5. You who get hot with lust among the terebinth trees, under every green tree, who slaughter the children in the valleys, under cliffs in the rock. I'll just give you some information. So the terebinth tree was kind of the chief tree of the Canaanite tree deities, as, as it were. So the terebinth tree was known really as the chief, the chief tree in this. And it's associated with the worship of Ashteret, or you might have heard Ashterot, Ashteret, getting hot with lust amongst your animistic gods, is what it's saying. Um, and in the valleys... Obviously, this is situational. Yeshayahu, Isaiah, is prophesying in and around Judea and in Jerusalem. So we have the Kidron and the Hinnom Valley. On the other side, down there is where sacrifices were made uh, and children were sacrificed. And the king Manasseh, he, he was guilty of that. The scripture describes it. So you're doing all this to false gods. Does anyone have any idea what else happened with this kind of worship? So we've got sacrificing babies. Are you aware of any of the other historical practices? Cult prostitution was one of the big ones, especially with um, Ashtaret, who was essentially like um, Aphrodite, so a uh, goddess of sexuality, of uh, fertility, this kind of goddess. And people, it was literally their job to prostitute themselves in the worship of these deities. Crazy. Among the smooth stones of the wadi, 
So a wadi is like a place where water floods through like a valley or it floods at a certain time of year and then it's a dry riverbed or floodbed at the other times of year. Among the smooth stones of the wadi is your portion. They are your lot. They are your lot. Okay, so don't just think of portion, think of chance. Think of dice. They are your lot. Also to them you have poured out a drink offering and then something that just hits me in the guts is in the Hebrew it says mincha. Mincha, it's a grain offering. It's specific to Le- the Levitical priesthood. So what does that tell us? It could be priests are involved, yes, but the point being they're syncretizing worship practices intended for God with these worship practices to idols and demons. So it's not just that they're idolatrous, they're syncretizing the worship of the God of Israel with this stuff. Now that is the worst form of idolatry. And again, you know, we could talk about how that's true in the church as well. Am I supposed to relent, regret, be comforted by or console myself because of these things? Let's have a think about what that can teach us. Among the smooth stones of the wadi. So these stones, they, they got smooth from the torrents of water that would come through these ditches or valleys. And then they were taken and they were basically imbued with power. You know, it's witchcraft, not cult. And sacrifices were put on them and they were attached to deities and so on. Upon a high and lofty mountain, you have set your bed. Remember the word bed? It actually got mentioned in the first few verses. You have set your bed. Here it alludes to adultery. In the first verses, what did it allude to? Death. So a bed is a figure of death. Use of the righteous... It infers rest, but used here of adultery, it connects adultery to death, the fruit of adultery. So you set up your bed, both of adultery and your own demise, and also there you went up to slaughter an animal sacrifice. The Achal, and behind Hadelet, this is interesting to me, behind the door, the Hamizuzah. Have you heard that word before? Mezuzah? Lilia? Have you seen one of those before, Lilia? Okay, so Lilia sees them on all the doors of my house. Mezuzah. A mezuzah is a little container that holds the scriptures that command us to write the word of God on our doorposts. To keep them close to our hearts. To have them at the corners of our garments. To teach our children when we sit down and when we arise, when you go out and when you come in. And actually, when we go out of the home, we say, Who guards my going out and my coming in. And then when we come in, we touch it and and kiss our lips and we say, Who guards my coming in and my going out. And so you see, he guards our everything. Our going out, our coming in, our coming in, our going out. But here's the heinous part of this. Look what they've done. Behind the door and the mezuzah, behind it, on the doorpost, you have set up your remembrances. That's a reference to a remembrance to another God. And they have put them behind the mezuzot. So they've camouflaged their idolatry with the word of God. Folks, am I the only one who realises how poignant this is for the church today? From me you have uncovered your bed. What that means is that I've been your husband. You've uncovered me and shamed me with your adultery. And have gone up from me, widening your bed. You haven't been ashamed of shaming me. What's more, you've gone on to do much worse. And you have cut off a piece of yourself with them. 
This is both literal and figurative, but it's first literal. They're actually cutting themselves for their false deities. What does the Torah say? Do not tattoo, do not mark your body or cut yourselves for the dead. So there's a reference to ancestral worship. You have loved their beard and then yad, and in Azaria's Bible it says manhood. The Hebrew word yad means hand. But it's a euphemism for a penis. So it's actually saying you've loved their bed and you loved looking at their penis. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to really get a bad reputation, <laughs> aren't I? Um, you, I just, just to be fair, you came here to hear what the Hebrew text says, right? So that's all I'm telling you. It's a euphemism. Kerry, I'm sorry if I've offended you. Okay, you need a microphone. Dear sister, we want to hear you. We want to hear you. All of that, just to be clear, it's graphic language. It's all figurative of idolatry. Okay. Yes, they are performing sex acts, but the bigger problem is that it's idolatry that they're performing. You travelled La Melech, and this is one we talked about before. You travelled La Melech to a king. You travelled to a king. But as we've talked about before, there's no nickel, don't know vowel markers in the Torah. And some translate Molech, who's a literal king to whom babies were sacrificed. He's a horned bull deity of the Canaanites. So you travel to this Molech, or to a king, a false god, with oil and a great amount of your perfumes, things to offer and worship. You sent your envoys to far off distant lands. That means to learn about the worship of false gods in other countries. To be humbled, abased and made low. And actually they were treated miserably and turned into slaves and prisoners. They were pursuing idolatry and found death again and again. Pursuing adultery on a bed of death. And then it says, Ad Sheol even as far as the place of the departed. Any thoughts on that? It's interesting language. We've talked a bit about it. It's okay. Refresh us. Refresh our memories. Um, the whole thing is, is even more shocking. It's not being conveyed in the English here. We, we agree on this. A lot of it is not being conveyed fully in the English. This is a, 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 an abominable, detestable cult practice. Yeah. They were actually sending ambassadors, representatives, killing them, with a message yeah. beyond the grave for yeah. the place of the dead, the yeah. dead, which is a, well, it's murder, but I mean, it's an abominable practice. And sadly ironic, given that it's appointed unto man once to die and then the judgment, they will receive no answer. But in the end, all they'll be doing is worshipping demons. Verse 11, whom did you dread and fear when you lay down? This is rhetorical. And did not remember me, nor did you lay it upon your core being. Hello, Ani. Have I not, Marche, or Meolam, have I not kept silent perpetually? Okay, elsewhere in the New Testament, we're told about the unlimited patience of God. Okay, that's a theological conundrum, isn't it? But I've kept silent, and you did not fear or revere me or be in awe of me. And I think, I just want to read you something, a Messianic Jew named Victor Buxbazen, um, he wrote this, and I think it's really interesting. He said, the apostate Israelites took the silence of their God for indifference, rather than attributing it to his long suffering. And I wonder how often we do that. We think God is silent. And we think that means he doesn't want to answer us or he's, he's left us or something like this. When in actual fact, he's patiently waiting for us to repent. And, and this, you know, this stuff is real today. It's real today. Verse 12. I will declare, make known your righteousness. This is interesting. So God's just rebuked all these guys time and again using this graphic language. Now, now through his prophet, he says, fine, I will declare your righteousness and your deeds 
and they will not profit you. What kind of righteousness is it? It's false righteousness. Yeah, interesting though, because one might say that's almost sarcastic. When you cry out, let your assembled heap deliver you. Okay, and that's a figurative way of talking about the idols, but, but God says your assembled heap. But the kulam, the lot of them, will be carried away by a wind, their breath taken away. But he who seeks refuge in me will inherit the land and will inherit Ha Kachi, my holy mountain. What mountains are you talking about? Zion, Habait, Hamakum, Hamoria. The Mount Zion, the mountain in Jerusalem, the Temple Mount. So, all this rebuke, and yet the God of mercy says, He who seeks refuge in me. So he says, okay, all you guys have done all this stuff, but even now, after you've performed some of the most vile things a human being can perform, I am saying to you, before the Babylonians come, I'm saying to you, if you seek refuge in me, you will inherit this land. You will inherit not just a mountain, but my holy mountain. Pretty gracious God we're seeing here. Turns out he's no different from the God of the New Testament. He's as gracious here as he is in the New Testament. Verse 14, they are ma and say, lift up, lift up. What does it mean when something's said twice? Firmly established. Turn toward the way. You know, you and I, we're members of the cult called Haderech, the way. Jews and Gentiles, if you were a follower of Yeshua, of Jesus, in the early days, they called you a member of the sect or the cult, Haderech, Haderech, the way. Interesting, isn't it? But here, the prophet goes on to offer a way. So he says, lift up, lift up, turn toward the way. Raise every occasion for stumbling out of the way of my people. Everything that might cause my people to stumble, tear it out and make a way for them. Can you guys think of anywhere else in Isaiah where something similar has been talked about? I know we're sort of going back a few chapters now. Yes, Rabbi. You talk about Isaiah 40? Oh, you're good! Just like that. So Ralph Chris somehow could see through my paper. <laughs> Isaiah 40, 3 to 5. And a voice cries out in the wilderness, prepare the way. Not a way, ha derech. Prepare the way of Adonai. That's Yudhevave. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley will be lifted up, every mountain will be made low, the rough ground will be a plain, and the rugged terrain smooth. The glory of Adonai will be revealed, and all flesh will see it together, for the mouth of Adonai is spoken. Baal Hashem. For thus, verse 15, the one who is high and lifted up and who dwells in eternity. I love that language. Holy is his name. I dwell in the high and holy place and with the one of a contrite and humble spirit. The word ruach is used to revive, sustain the life of ruach. Shifalim, a humble spirit, and to revive the core being of the contrite ones. Now we often, there's popular language, we talk about revival, don't we? The, re, the reason we use the word revival is because revival actually starts with the community of faith. Something is being revived. It means it had to already be present in the culture, in the church culture, as it were, or in the community. And that's why throughout history, whenever we see these great moves of God and salvation of numerous numbers of people, 
They always, without fail, start in the church community. They don't just start randomly in places. Not revivals. Salvations can happen like that. But revivals always start by the church that has become complacent being refired, ignited, returning, returning to devout faith. Devout faith. Not kaha kaha faith. Not so so faith. For I will not, this is verse 16, for I will not contend forever, nor will I always be angry. This is the nature of our God. Mercy precedes judgment. For the spirit from before my faith would grow faint. He's talking about the spirit of human beings. If he were to be angry forever, we would grow faint and fall away as nothing. So he's merciful, so he won't. And then it uses an interesting Hebrew word, it says, and it says, U nishamot. Nishamot, it comes from the Hebrew word nishama. This is a very, very important word to use because whether you like it or not, some people don't like it, particularly certain theologians. Every living thing that has air in its lungs is actually a nephesh, a soul. That's a problem for some theologians. Also, living things with air in their lungs have ruach, they have spirit as well. And I'm, I'm not making this up, this is how Genesis literally describes them. So a dog has soul and spirit. So does a human being. But only one created entity has a convergent element called neshama. There's ruach, spirit. There's nefesh, soul. But a dog, an animal, doesn't have neshama, the direct convergent soul, spirit, breath of God, which was breathed into humanity. That sets us apart. And we've talked about consciousness. I'd venture to say our consciousness is not in our brain, as I've said before. It's imparted to us uniquely and not to a dog or a cat or a cow or anything else. But it's imparted to us uniquely in this convergent term, neshama, which unifies soul and spirit in a very unique way. He's specifically talking about the human race to whom he directly imparted his breath. That I'm the soul life breath that I made and fashioned. So he knows that we will grow faint if he were angry forever. Verse 17. In the perversity of his unjust gain, I was angry and struck him. I concealed myself and was angry. But he went, turning back in the way of his own core being. His ways I have seen, and I will heal him. And I will lead him and restore. And, and actually the Hebrew says, Va ashalem, va ashalem. Actually, through a covenant of peace, or through an agreement of peace, but quite literally it says, and through wholeness and peace, offer comfort to him and his mourners. The Pil Shem, the Pharisees, shared the theology of Yeshua. And we have something similar here where there's a syncretism that's going on. And God is appear that's why he says draw near. Yeshua rebukes the Pharisees most often. You see him occasionally he rebukes the, the, the Sadducees, the, the Sadducees, occasionally. But it's only occasionally. By far the majority of his rebukes to religious leaders are made to Pil Shem, to Pharisees. And it's because they were so close and at once so far away. They had everything they needed to walk in truth and yet their walk did not mirror their mouth. It's, again, it's coming to us today in the community. You and I are being in some sense, challenged with these same names. You know, are we, are we Benzona? Are we? Because this is where it's starting. If we want to see a nation change, it has to start with our, ourselves, with our community. 
Verse 19, we're almost at the end, guys. Borei, creating from nothing, fruit of lips. Shalom, shalom, firmly established peace. Okay, this is for those who are repentant, who he will heal. Firmly established peace. To the far, that's the Māori people in New Zealand. To the far, that's the Cree in Lower Canada and Upper United States. To far... Yes, Rabitzin. Okay, Scotland. And to those who are near, the Yehudin, the Jew. But the wicked are like a tossing sea, for it will neither be silent or prevail, and its waters throw up mud and clay. In Shalom, there is no peace, says Elohei for the wicked. In Shalom, there is no peace. What did we notice? For those with contrite hearts who are being redeemed, Shalom, Shalom. But there is mercy even in the last rebuke to the wicked. There is Ain Shalom for the wicked. Shalom, Shalom is firmly established. You can't move it. God said it. It's a done deal. But Shalom is still in time and space, giving the wicked an opportunity to what? Repent. This is the God of grace who has not changed their door to door from generation to generation. He is not the half-time Christian God of the book of Matthew. He is El Elohai Swail from the beginning to the end. He has not changed. God is love. They say that God is love. What? It says that twice explicitly in the Bible. Twice. How many times does it say God is holy? Hundreds of times. God is love. They say that love wins. They say that love wins. But love isn't love unless it's just. It comes from the holy God. This is what awe means. Awe means love is defined by God. God is not defined by love. That awe is coming, and we do not want to be on the other side of it. Trust me. Can you summarise for us what this text is saying to the church today? Yeah. And how we might be able to respond? To oh, this? yeah, yeah. Halakha. Halakha is the way we walk. What is hiding underneath God's word in our lives? What is hiding? See, because God doesn't hide things. He brings them out into the light. So by inference, I'm saying, what is it that's not of God that's hiding underneath God's word in our life? That's one of the messages with the mezuzot on the doors. What they were doing was they were putting their witchcraft or their idol worship behind the mezuzah and covering it up. What are we individually and what is the church covering up using God's word to do it? This is a very important question to ask. I know I'm not really answering, I'm answering you with a question. But what I'm saying is, if we want to walk this, we have to ask the questions. Because the answers aren't always easy. You know, what is hiding? What is, for example, hiding, what I would say is this. Um, things like counterfeits, counterfeits. So we prop up our love with the counterfeit of niceness. So if the mezuzah is love, we've hidden niceness behind it so that nice informs our love. And therefore, our love becomes sin. Because in order to be nice all the time, well, you don't rebuke someone that's not nice therefore now it's not loving either so what i'm saying is there are subtle things so when i say what is hiding behind god's word i mean things like counterfeits like niceness replacing love or informing love judgment who hasn't heard someone say you can't judge they are hiding behind the word of god because they're limiting judgment to one passage where elsewhere Yeshua says, 
Make a right judgment. Don't judge by mere appearances. Make a right judgment. So they're using the word judge to cloud the issue of discernment. And here's something else. Oh, look, someone's got a gift of discernment in the church. Really don't like when they speak up. Know what I'm going to call that? Criticism. I'm going to be statistical here. I don't usually like using statistics. It's, it's a flawed science. But statistically, the Christ, Western Christian Church, Evangelical Church, has a divorce rate equal to secular society. You know that? It's 50-50. Didn't used to be, but it is today. So I don't even have to get to the allegory or the figure of what adultery and divorce means in the church. I can start with, what are we hiding behind to allow this to happen? There are only three clear admonitions that qualify divorce in the scripture. Are we sticking by them? Or are we making up, are we hiding a whole lot of others behind them? And are they informing our counsel when people come to us? We don't say, we're for you, wife. <clears throat> oh, it's terrible what he's done. We don't say, we're for you, husband. Oh, it's disgusting how she's behaved. We say, we are for your marriage. These are the kind of things that call... Now, I'm telling you right now, what I'm saying is offensive to a lot of Christians. But it's not offensive to God's word. I won't hide... Oh, I suppose you can get divorced. I mean, you're clearly not going to work things out. Behind, except for sexual immorality. Behind, I hate divorce and I hate a man who clothes himself with violence. Behind the clear teaching of Paul, if an unbelieving partner will not stay with you, then you're free to divorce. These are the three admonitions. This is just one, I mean, I can go on all night, but this is practical. How do you advise others? Do you advise them according to the scripture or according to your niceness? Cultural niceness does not determine truth. And we're hiding all this stuff behind our mezuzot, our metaphorical mezuzot. We're hiding them. And then our, our adultery, so literally, I wonder how many people would engage in adultery as quickly if they understood that the bed of adultery is intrinsically linked to death. The Bible clearly teaches it. What if we taught our people that to enter into an adulterous relationship will lead to your death and quite probably your untimely death? What if we taught that? A little bit of awe wouldn't go amiss. But you know what people will say when I teach that? You're fear-mongering. You're teaching fear. The fear of God is an end to fear. So, okay, then fear God, and you won't be afraid anymore. So choose not to commit adultery, and you won't be afraid anymore. Yeah, there's forgiveness for all this, but I'm just saying, this is what the church is today. We're hiding be behind the word of God. We need to come back to understanding the person of Yeshua, Jesus, as essential. We need to come back to understanding the word of God is also part of what it means to have Yeshua be essential. We need to come back to the fact, and I've said it before, but we, don't, we say we believe in the inerrancy of Scripture in its original languages. That's what we say here. If you don't say that, I'd venture to suggest you need to meet Jesus. Okay, But if you do say that, we are not testifying to the infallibility of human beings who wrote it down. We are testifying to the inerrancy of God. The Enlightenment, as Errol rightly said, brought all of this into question. The Enlightenment did this. Instead of allowing Scripture to critique us, we decided we would sit in judgment of it. That's the opposite of the gospel. So we need to come back to understanding that if our faith doesn't line up with what the book says, it's us that needs to change, not the book. It's us that needs to change, not our interpretation of the book. And if other people abuse you, so be it. 
In this world you will have trouble, name it and claim it. 